Great. And so we've talked about now making the diagnosis, uh, doing the genetic testing. Let's move a little bit to staging of the disease. Uh, Eric, what, what are the current standards of, of care with respect to staging? So I, mean, I think staging is, you know, you want to look at neck, you want, well, sorry, the first part of staging is you want to know the calcitonin the CA, and that's going to really give you a good idea about presence of disease or no presence of disease. And um, after that, you know, you like to get imaging of the neck. The neck is always an area that you want to always watch out very carefully for, um, since that's where people could run to problems earlier. And then I think it's chest and, and liver. And how you do that, it's, it could be done with various um, uh, modalities. I don't think that PET CT scan plays a very big role in the beginning. I think it's an expensive test that doesn't really add anything to it. Um, and the idea is really you should be following how people are going to do over time. So even if they have disease present elsewhere, it doesn't mean you have to act on it right away. A lot of times it might be if it's metastatic, it's incurable, but it's a slow growing disease. So you just want to know where they are in the baseline so you can follow them afterwards and get an idea about things like rate of growth of disease. So Eric brought up you know, a very important point, which is that we follow two different biomarkers in this disease. We follow calcitonin, but also CEA. Um, in general, as you follow patients over time, these two markers march in parallel. So you see fairly similar uh, increases, proportionate increases or changes in calcitonin and CEA. There are the occasional patients where the calcitonin level grossly underestimates the level of the disease. They have a more poorly differentiated tumor or one that's not making uh, the, the product of calcitonin. And those tend to have a disproportionately high CEA. So you can also, by just that initial assessment of calcitonin and CEA, get some concept of the biology of the tumor. And then following these two markers sequentially over time, because if you see the calcitonin not rise or even fall, you may be fooled by a disease that's rapidly progressing that will be evidenced by that rise in the CEA. So following both together is very important. And from a practical standpoint, following both together helps you interpret the calcitonin. Because the calcitonin number just bounces all over the place. Mm -hmm. It may be 100 one day, 150 the next day, 75 the next day. And patients just freak out every time it's going up and down. So for me, as long as the CEA is staying relatively the same, it lets you read through that up and down calcitonin bounce. And it's only when both of them really start marching up together that I say, okay, maybe we've got a real trend. And that's particularly true when the patients that the oncologists follow that have calcitonins of 3,000 and 5,000, 8,000, that even if you measure it the same day several times, it'll be up and down 1,000, 2,000 points. And it also varies dramatically depending on what assay you do. That the calcitonin assay is not standardized at all. You can get a number of 5,000 at one lab and you can get a number of 2,000 at another lab. So when we're trying to figure out are, is the calcitonin changing or progressive, Unfortunately, you have to look at just numbers from the same lab. And so many patients come see us in consult, they've got numbers from all over, and it's really difficult. The CEA is a little more steady, so you can see the CEA through the various labs. But with the calcitonin, it's almost incomprehensible when they're being drawn at different labs. Lori, what, what's your approach in terms of uh, staging and imaging? Uh, I pretty much agree with Eric, um, the, uh, although I do have to say that there are times um, when a PET scan will be helpful and it may be in the case of uh, a patient who has high calcitonin and a high CEA uh, yet doesn't have any uh, evaluable disease on CT imaging. So a neck CT, chest CT uh, may be completely normal after thyroidectomy and neck dissection in a patient. And if the calcitonin level and CEA levels are high, say the calcitonin is 3,000, 4,000, 4, um, then I, I do find a PET CT can be useful. Um, the other test that I think is critically important in that setting is an MRI of the liver. Um, so one of the classic patterns of disease uh, in medullary thyroid carcinoma is basically milli disease within the liver um, that can be completely missed on a CT scan of the liver and can even be difficult to appreciate on an MRI of the liver. Um, uh, but uh, but that uh, can be found on an MRI. And there are um, patients who have bony metastasis that aren't always found even on a bone scan that can be found on a, on a PET CT. So uh, that test can be helpful when you're trying to look for the or characterize the overall disease burden. I wouldn't necessarily follow patients over time with a PET CT scan, however. That said, 
liver MRIs uh, are useful, I think, for serial imaging in patients who have established disease to follow up. And I think one of the point that Lori's making about the PET scan, the underlying thing is she's talking about people that have calcitonin as a two and three thousand. There's a couple papers that show if the calcitonin is less than a thousand, the PET scan is more likely to give you a false positive than real disease. So when we're up in that multi thousand, there's been two or three papers that basically show you need every test neck CT, chest CT, spine MRI, pelvis MRI, liver MRI, liver ultrasound. Any single test has a sensitivity that's pretty bad, but it's the combination of tests over time. So in real clinical practice, I find myself, I'm in that situation where I can't find the disease or the calcitonin is too high for the level of disease I'm seeing, is flipping back and forth between those tests. Maybe a CT this time, maybe a spine MRI next time. So it's no one single test that finds us for it. It's the conglomerate of all we put together. There is a, a point there, though, um, about the relative uselessness of bone scans. Um, th this is a disease where it's really a waste to do that. Uh, you need structural imaging to look at, uh, to find bone metastases. And, and in our shop, you know, bone MRI of the spine and pelvis are the standard procedure we do. Instead of liver MRI, we do triple phase CT of the liver. But the point is you, you really need tomographic imaging with contrast enhancement to pick up these often hypervascularized tiny metastatic lesions that represent early metastases. The big, bulky, destructive lesions you're going to find with almost anything. But early uh, detection and then monitoring, you really need good tomography. So this is a great discussion. In summary, we're going to usually get a CT scan of the neck and chest almost every patient. We're going to get biochemical markers on every patient, and we're going to let those biochemical markers and the patient's symptoms drive further testing, such as uh, MRI of the liver, uh, perhaps a more sophisticated CT of the liver, uh, and um, imaging of uh, bones and, and spinal cord. Terrific.